let's say V is right here and W is right there. And I'd like to figure out the shadow that V would cast along the line through W if light rays were coming in perpendicular to the line through W, causing V to cast a shadow. The shadow of V would look like this. That vector, which you can see from the picture seems to be unique, is called the projection of V along W. And by the way, if W were pointing in the opposite direction, still parallel, but in the opposite direction, the projection of V along W would still be the same vector. It's not the, the direction left or right of W that matters. It's, it's the line through W that matters. It would still be the projection of V along W. And notationally it's written P-R-O-J sub W of V. Projection of V along W. It's kind of like function notation here. Projection of V along W. It is a vector, not a scalar. Sometimes people think of projections as scalars, in which case it'd be effectively the length of this vector. But I'd be more likely, and textbooks would be more likely to call that the component of V along W. Projection is a vector. Let's stick with that. Hmm. How can we find this vector? Well, we have a right triangle in here. Maybe a little trigonometry is useful. Got an angle theta. And anytime we have an angle between, between vectors, from now on, if it hasn't to this point, it should set off alarm bells in your mind. Vectors, angle, dot products must be useful. Okay, make a habit of thinking that way. I've got a couple of vectors, I've got an angle. Probably the dot product is going to be useful in some way. The length of V might be useful as well. Its magnitude is the length of that arrow, which is the hypotenuse of the triangle, right? In fact, I could figure out the length of this right away. Let's call it length. <laughs> What is the length of that? By trigonometry, so Sokotoa. So and if I want to relate it to dot products, I probably better use the ka. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The cosine of theta is the adjacent side in this right triangle to the angle, which is what I'm labeling with the word length, unknown length. Divide by the length of the hypotenuse, the magnitude of V. That implies the length of that, that, that unknown length is the magnitude of V times the cosine of the angle. Maybe you're somebody who's done that kind of thing so much, you could just write that down without doing this other stuff. Right? You've, you've done so many right triangle trigonometry problems in solving all your physics problems. You can do it in your sleep. That length is that, okay. How is this helpful? That's the length of the projection. This is not just a plano length, it's a length of the projection vector. If I could find a unit vector, a vector of length one in the same direction as W, all I would have to do to find the projection vector is rescale it by this length. Say it again. If I could find a unit vector pointing in the same direction as W to find the projection vector, all I have to do is scale it in this picture, scale it up by the length of the projection vector, which I know. So what's a unit vector in the direction of W? Somebody tell me. How do I find a unit vector in the direction of W. We talked about this last Friday. Go ahead. Yep. 
multiply W by the inverse or reciprocal of its magnitude, often written for shorthand like this. As long as W is not the zero vector, which, yeah, at least in the picture, we're assuming W is not the zero vector. This is a unit vector in the same direction as W. So we're getting close here, getting close. Uh, I can feel it. Therefore, the projection vector of V along W should be this length times, that, that scalar times this unit vector. This is a scalar, a number, this is a vector. That is one formula for the projection vector. However, it's not a super useful formula because we'd have to figure out theta first if we're going to use it. We'd like to avoid figuring out theta to figure out this projection vector. A little bit of trickery will help us do that. And the trick is to multiply by a disguised form of one. So it's not going to change the value of this. Multiply it by the magnitude of W over the magnitude of W. I'm going to put one factor of the magnitude of W next to the magnitude of V. And another factor of the magnitude of W in the denominator next to the original magnitude of W. In other words, I'm going to take the magnitude of W and square it. Another bit of trickery, rearranging, is I'm going to take this thing and bring it over here underneath all this. It is, after all, a scalar. But wait a minute, we still have the angle in there. How do I get rid of it? Oh, wait a minute. That's our old friend, V dot W. That's how to get rid of it. So the final simplification includes a V dot W in the numerator. It also includes a dot product in the denominator. What should be, the, how should I write that as a dot product? Magnitude of W squared is W dotted itself, right? Because the magnitude of W is the square root of W dotted itself. I'm squaring it, so the square root goes away. This is a scalar, this is a vector. The whole product is a vector. This is the formula people use for the projection vector of V along W. Why do we care? What's this useful for? Projection vectors in one example application can come up this way if you uh, if this is like an inclined plane and you've got a block, a mass on the inclined plane that you're pushing up the inclined plane and this vector V is the force vector, a constant force vector that you're using to apply to the mass to push it up the plane. The dot product of V with the displacement vector gives you the work done by the force. Another way to think of that is to take the projection vector, find its length, and multiply that times the distance. That's another way to find the force or the, the work done. Okay, that's a fairly simple, common example in basic physics classes. Uh, dot products come up in more complicated situations where you're still thinking about work done. Oh, let's see if I can get this right. Like, for example, the Earth going around the sun. What's the work done by the gravitational force of the sun on the earth as the earth moves? Can I get this right? At each, well, you have to end up doing, uh, you have to end up doing an integral in the end. But for each small amount of distance that the earth travels, goes in an, in an ellipse around the sun. But if it's traveling just a small amount of distance over a small amount of time, Effectively, it's going straight. There's a displacement vector. 
the dot product of the force vector from the sun along that displacement vector is the work done by the force of gravity on the earth during that small amount of time. No, it's a dot product. And it gives you the change in kinetic energy. The earth doesn't travel along, around, along a perfect circle around the sun. It's an ellipse. Its velocity vector is not constant length. The speed is not constant. It changes a little bit. So that actually, with respect to the sun, at least, the kinetic energy of the earth does change a tiny bit over time. Yeah, you do need, do need dot products for it. Not perpendicular to it. It's 90 degrees to the, to the, um, to the path of the earth at that moment in time. Oh, uh, well, okay, it's not always 90 degrees, sorry. If it's an ellipse, yeah, let's, let's draw it more extreme for, for illustration purposes. If the sun is right there and the earth is right here, uh, the force vector points in that direction and your displacement vector points in that direction. So yeah, it's not 90 degrees in general. And you can think of this in terms of projections as well. But to find the total work done over a longer amount of time, you have to do an integral. An important special case of all this is when uh, what you're thinking of, I think the dot product is zero. What happens when the dot product is zero? If V dot W is zero, then this thing is zero. That can happen even if V and W themselves are not the zero vector, as long as the cosine of the angle is zero. Cosine of 90 degrees is zero, pi over two radians. The dot product being zero tells you the vectors are perpendicular, more generally called orthogonal. Basically, that's synonymous with perpendicular, orthogonal. You'll see it in the book. The dot product is zero. The angle is 90 degrees, pi over two radians. They are perpendicular or orthogonal. By the way, you might be wondering, well, is the angle really 90 degrees? Couldn't it also be 270 degrees? And yes, you could think of it as 270 degrees. But that would be an equivalent angle with the same cosine. Okay. If you take 45 degrees, for example, um, you could also think of it as, what, 325 degrees? The cosine of 325 degrees and the cosine of 45 degrees are the same. Square root of 2 over 2. And that happens more generally for more general angles. We typically think of the angle as being the smallest positive angle that works. It's also useful, once you found the projection vector, to find another vector in this picture that's perpendicular to the projection vector and such that when you add it to the projection vector, you can get V. So the picture looks like this. We might wonder, what is this vector? That can be found by realizing that the projection vector plus this unknown vector vector have to be V, has to be V. Therefore, this unknown vector better be V minus the projection vector. Say that again. By the picture, we're after this vector such that when it's added to the projection vector, you get V. Therefore, this unknown vector is V minus the projection vector. Symbolically, if I call the unknown vector X, I want X plus the projection vector to equal V itself. That means X must be V minus the projection vector. Oops. X must be V minus the projection vector of V along W. This vector is perpendicular to the projection vector. This symbol means perpendicular to, or we could say orthogonal. The book defines orthogonal vector, vectors to be orthogonal only when they're non-zero. Technically, also, the zero vector dotted with any other vector is the number zero. And vector dot products, just like 
vectors themselves satisfy all sorts of algebraic properties that you would hope they would. On page 589, there are these properties. U dot V equals V dot U, a commutative property. It doesn't matter what order you do the dot product in. That's a distributive property. U dot the sum V plus W is U dot V plus U dot W. Realize that these pluses, these additions here are different kinds of additions. The one on the left is vector addition. The one on the right is the sum of two numbers. Very important to keep those kinds of conceptual things in your mind. V plus W is the sum of two vectors, which is a vector. If I dot it with the vector U, I get a number. This entire thing is a number. U dot V and U dot W are both numbers. This is an addition of numbers. But this does work. It's not too hard to prove. There's an associative kind of property. And also the C can be brought over here. That's kind of a commutative property. The C is a scalar. The zero vector dotted with any vector is the number zero. Notice this vector, this zero has a little arrow above it and this zero does not, that's not a typo. In some books, this vector would be a bold face U and this would be a not bold face U. That's the vector zero, that's the number zero. And once again, what I've already emphasized, the square of the magnitude of any vector is the vector dotted with itself. This last property is more important than you might imagine. <clears throat> 